Well, let's let's imagine um, if you knew like the life you wanted was at the bottom of a cliff, right? And you knew that you had to like jump off this cliff in order for you to receive whatever there is at the bottom. Most people are just going to look at it and be like, ah, I'm probably going to die when I get down there. They won't take that action because it's going to have that that feeling arise. I think if, if we can imagine that no matter what action you took in this life wouldn't kill you, wouldn't destroy your relationships, wouldn't this, wouldn't that, you are much more inclined to be like, all right, well, I'm going to go give that a try, where, where mostly people don't even... It's forget they don't they don't even look for their walls. It's not even they're not even seeking the limitation. They're like ten feet back from even moving up against that limitation. And a business, if you're gonna play that game, if you're gonna be an entrepreneur, that's kind of the curse and the gift of it is that it's gonna show you your limitations. It's gonna show you your walls. It's your wanting and ability to step forward and be like, all right, I'm gonna like rub elbows with this brick wall, see what I'm made out of, seek for new ways to kind of get over it, right? Get over it and find what's on the other side of it. And that's a con consistent pattern is entrepreneurship. Any entrepreneur knows you're not comfortable. <laughs> Welcome to Barbell Business. I'm Mike Bledsoe here with Doug Larson and Marcus Gersey. We have our guest today, Mr. Guy Ferdman. Um, and we're going to be talking about, I don't know, next level coaching? Uh, what are we going to call this? <laughs> sure. sure, why not? Uh, real quick before we get into that, make sure that you go follow our new Instagram account, Barbell Business Podcast, because the Barbell Business Instagram account uh, by... So, I don't know, we're gonna blame Hunter. Um, he totally <laughs> fucked it up, and, and now we don't have now we don't have uh, that Instagram account. So we had to start over. So now we're what are we up to? Like two hundred, two hundred follows. Yeah, yeah. Oh, like nah, we're probably, we're over two thousand. We're over a thousand now. Oh yeah. man, that was quick. a few million. I think this guy <laughs> Hunter knows how to grow an Instagram list. That's for sure. Yep. Um, and if you didn't know, uh, we also Facebook Live, Instagram Live these shows so uh you know we l release them every tuesday but if you're paying attention to what we have going on on social media you might be able to catch some of this content early so you'll have it before everybody else Fuck yeah. you get the advantage <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah, that's right very good um yeah we're gonna get into some next level coaching i guess sure i don't know uh one of the things we're gonna be doing is we're launching a coaching program soon you're launching a coaching program and one of the things that I uh, think is really lacking in strength and conditioning and CrossFit world is a lot of times people think about coaching as a very one-dimensional thing it's movement it's program design mm. um, and then um, and then working in business myself I realized wow there's business coaches there's there's life coaches there's like all these different flavors of coaches and then after after being exposed to a lot of different styles of coaching I start learning oh the principles all really the same. Coaching at its core is this thing, and I think a lot of us are missing out on um, how to get to the core of what's happening with whether they're an athlete or a business owner or something like that. What's at the core of what's keeping them from achieving what it is that they're trying to achieve? And you come from you've you've done a lot of stuff, and you used to be an internet marketer. Yeah, I mean, I continue to be one. You're still, a, yeah. I mean, we're all marketers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if you're running a business, you have to be absolutely. Um, but you've been studying personal development for a long time and you've been in coaching, but you're catch coaching people at a different, uh, what are, what are people's goals when they start with you? If you're coaching them? Yeah. I think well, you guys have a lot of like specificity and what you're trying right. to achieve for me. It's a lot more, um, like mastering a dance. It's, it sounds difficult to, for you to sell what you have as a coach. It is. Cause for us, it's like, Oh, you want to lose weight like so if i'm a fitness coach it's like oh you want to lose weight you want to get bigger stronger you want to accomplish i know that there's probably a dozen tasks or less probably like two or three right. that people are trying to get better at so i can get very niche there and then what you're getting for people is much broader absolutely you, have, you guys have like a super defined goal like my my oriented mission in life is a transformation of 100 million people that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people Overall, what I'm interested in is just human peak performance. So people just stepping into uh, different communication patterns, 
relationships that matter to them and actually work, um, them moving towards what they're passionate about, impacting other people's lives. Uh, I'm for, and I'm sure at some level you guys are too, at just transforming social aspects of people, how they operate in the world. So I agree with you. I do tend to attract a lot of entrepreneurs. Right. I don't think any entrepreneur, whether you're brand new to the game, whether you're considering it, the moment you get in, you're going to immediately be struck with, okay, the growth of my business is stagnant. Why is it stagnant? And if you really, it's pretty easy to correlate it to your own belief systems, actions you're not willing to take, you know, fears that you've probably dealt with a lifetime and the business is just going to push everything up right to your face for you to deal with. And I've stepped in for a lot of those people and helped them. So you're right in the essence of, I don't have clear defined goals with people necessarily always, but the people who come to me, generally speaking, they're playing some kind of game, which is like a business or they want to like change a relationship or they want to move or they want to move towards a passion. And I'm very clear that whenever I create something with them, there is a specific measurable result that they can look out in reality and say, oh, wow, I can see I'm actually progressing. I see I'm making movement. I feel different. I'm speaking different, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, business owners, I, I think, are attracted to that kind of work specifically because they, they are recognizing that I'm the only thing holding this back. And people who start businesses tend to be more friendly to change in the first place. Yeah. Uh, just because to start a business is a big change. Mm -hmm. you, you usually leave some, what, what's perceived as a safe job of a nine to five gig or something like that, and you're stepping out and is starting your own thing. So usually I, I find that people who own businesses are just better at taking on risk than the average person. Mm -hmm. And at some point, what's holding that person back is, is fears and beliefs. What, what is, uh, you've worked with so many people, how many, what do you see as like the number one, is there like a, a number one thing that you start with or the, the most common thing that you start talking to someone you're like, oh, you're, you have trouble with this? Yeah. Uh, so uh, for a long time, my personal belief has been that there's like a disease on the planet and the disease is not heart disease. It's not any of the shit that we hear about. It's a matter of self-value and self-worth. Everybody's gone through some experience when they were young, something happened, you raise your hand at school, you thought you had the answer, everyone laughed at you, and it immediately starts a conversation of I'm no good, or I'm bad, or I'm unlovable, whatever that circumstance was for you. And you start operating from that place and you never break free. And what that does is it creates a filter through which you view your life from, and everything comes through that filter. As you get older and you start like failing at different <laughs> aspects of life, you go, well, I'm not going to do that anymore. That's not safe. That's not safe. That's not safe. So like, if I could give you an analogy, and I think you guys will relate to this, if you're, if like a kid is born and you think like this is a being of infinite possibility, right? And you're a being, and let's say that being is like a castle with thousands of room, rooms and every room stands for a different way that you could be. When we're young, it's like we give a grand tour of the castle over and over again. And at the end, we ask for feedback. We're like, hey, what do you think of this place that I have here? The person's like, well, it's all really great, but there's that one room in the back. It's fucked up. You got to do something about that. So you keep giving the grand tour. You keep getting that feedback on it. And eventually, you're like, okay, maybe there's something wrong with this room. So you kind of walk in there. You're like, all right, we'll repaint it, get new furniture. We'll feng shui. And then after I get it all right, I'm going to put it back on the tour. So you do that and you put it back on the tour. No matter what changes you make, you still get that same feedback. So you're like, fuck it. I have all these other rooms. Boom. And you close that door. And over a lifetime, we do that to the entire castle. And by the time I'm sure somebody shows up to work with you, works with me, and you're like, so who are you? Tell me about you. And it's like two doors are left open right. in this whole castle. And then they're like, I know who I am. And it's like, I'm this what I do. I'm this in my family. And that's how you define your entire life, forgetting that you're a being of infinite possibility. So when I look at coaching, it's about going to rediscover those doors and then redefining what safety means. Because for a lot of adults, we look at an adult as like something that happens to you naturally, but adult is a choice. It's just a conversation, right? So most of it's like, we look at adults like children with responsibility, but it's just a way- I've heard, I've heard the term is uh, overripe. Overripe, <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Basically, we're just distraught children who now have more power, who can create more destruction, but we've never really upgraded our conversation to being an adult. So like one of the distinctions we use is like age of conversation. So like I'm bad, the age of that conversation is three years old. You can upgrade that to an adult conversation. So same thing with safety, like safety for most people is like running upstairs, getting in the bed, pulling the sheets over their head and that makes them feel safe. But that's safety like a child, not safety like an adult. So then you go out in the world and you wanna produce, you wanna do something, you wanna do something great, you wanna impact people and you're like, this isn't safe because you haven't taken the time to really investigate and look at that and realize that you've looked at the frame of safety in one way your entire life instead of all the infinite ways that you could choose safety to be. 
So are, you're, you're you're referencing like emotional, psychological safety, like like safe from judgment from other people, safe from being from being hurt in a relationship, safe sure. from being you know told that you're not good enough, things like that. Absolutely. Mm. So just to kind of like go back to your original question, if if I think the starting point for for any person is number one, understanding that the thoughts in your head are like what you hear is not your thoughts at all. Like you want to disassociate from what you're listening to. If if it was your thoughts, you wouldn't have the presence of mind that you're actually like observing it. You're more the observer of the thought than the actual thought. So like the feedback system you're getting, biologically speaking, is like your mind doing its thing, which is to keep you safe. It's doing a really good job for all of us because guess what? We're here, right? So it's the same thing that tells you to uh, get out of the way when a car is like barreling down on you. It's the same thing that tells you to get your hand off the stove. But when it comes to social situations, it's doing the same thing. It's constantly giving you safety feedback. And if you're not disassociated from it, you think, oh, these are my thoughts. I'm telling myself all these things. And it tends to be quite negative, not really giving you positive affirmation or feedback. And that's what holds you back. So the first thing you want to look at is, hey, there's a little voice in your head. And the person who's like, what little voice? The, the little voice that said, what little voice is the little voice I'm talking about. So pay attention to that little <laughs> voice. Right? So I always like tell them, all right, do you know that you have a little voice in your head? And they're like, huh? And then I'm just, okay, let's just pause for a second, like be quiet and then just listen. And of course, the mind chatter is always going. So it's like right there. And then if they don't notice, I say that. I'm like, do you notice a little voice? They're like, what little voice? I'm like, the little voice. I just said, what little voice? So then, you know, and then you create this association right away and you start observing instead of being in it. Um, that's number one. And then number two is just like the ability to um, redefine what responsibility means. And we can kind of get into all that world, but I just want to let you guys <laughs> chime in. Yeah, what, what, uh, <laughs> when somebody is... What are, what are some common things that people say that might signal to you that they don't feel safe or they're, they're having that, they're behaving like a child, not an adult in the, in the safety from that, that, I guess, perspective, that yeah, context. I think it's pretty simple. If you, if you have a want, a desire and you're not taking actions consistent with that desire, why aren't you taking that action? So there's what's in the way is some, some conversation about fear or safety that's in the way that, that you're just don't feel like, well, well, if I do that, you actually have the sensation of death, you know, like when in an argument with somebody and they have an opposing point of view, biologically speaking, the way it occurs to the mind is the same thing, like a knife coming at your face. It's like all the protective mechanisms come up and anybody who's ever been in like an argumentative kind of situation when you're sitting around the table with someone and they're opining and you're opining, do you ever walk away and go, oh, man, Jeff, thank you so much. You've really fucking changed my life with that opinion. That is now my new opinion. You know, it's just such a waste of time. So we do that to our, <laughs> <laughs> and we do that to ourselves all the time as well. We like opine, we scare, we put ourselves in like fear situations and the, and the brain and the subconscious is constantly like people are like, oh, I have anxiety. Yeah, that's a natural state of your body is to like, you're constantly like a radar picking up things in your environment that are beneath the surface of your consciousness that are firing in ways that you can't possibly imagine. So it's like pre-priming anxiety and fear to protect you. Because if a dog or something is happening, it's like, oh shit, you got to get out of the way. And we all know you've fallen down the stairs, you like magically catch yourself. There's all these mechanisms at play. However, as you grow, grow older, you know, you're picking up on stuff. So if you had like a girlfriend who had a red truck and that girlfriend broke your heart at some point in time, somewhere in your brain, red truck is associated with heartbreak. And every time you drive down the highway and see a red truck, a small part of you remembers heartbreak. And it's just, and it just like builds and builds and builds like that till you're just so unconscious of everything that's causing fear and then you're just debilitated and taking action. So many people might be listening to this and they're thinking like, okay, we're talking about like emotional psychological safety <laughs> and, and, and heartbreak and like, how's that going to make, help me make more money? How's that going to help me get more members in my gym? How, how's that going to help my customers get, get better results, et cetera. So uh, th this is a kind of a deep talk topic. It's like what is underlying a lot of the decisions that are, that are made in our, in our daily lives. So how, how is feeling emotionally and psychologically safe beneficial to an entrepreneur? Like what's the benefit there? Well, Let's imagine this. Because no one would probably say, like, if, if you say, like, I'm kind of stagnant in my business, why is that? Most people probably wouldn't come out and be like, well, it's because I just don't feel safe. Yeah. That's my problem. No yeah. one's going to give you that response, right? Like, I don't think I've ever asked anyone what, what they think their problem is, and they brought up safety. Right. Even if that is the deeper underlying problem. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> that's a great question. I, 
<laughs> you know what? Rephrase it a little bit for me. I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm answering it the way that you. Just what, what's the beneficial for for anyone to to feel safe? How's it? How is feeling safe going to help an entrepreneur like grow his company? Okay. Well, let's let's imagine um, if you knew like the life you wanted was at the bottom of a cliff, right? And you knew that you had to like jump off this cliff in order for you to receive whatever there is at the bottom. Most people are just going to look at it and be like, ah, I'm probably going to die when I get down there. They won't take that action because it's going to have that that feeling arise. I think if, if we can imagine that no matter what action you took in this life wouldn't kill you, wouldn't destroy your relationships, wouldn't this, wouldn't that, you are much more inclined to be like, all right, well, I'm going to go give that a try, where, where mostly people don't even... If it's forget it, they don't they don't even look for their walls. It's not even they're not even seeking the limitation. They're like ten feet back from even moving up against that limitation. And a business, if you're gonna play that game, if you're gonna be an entrepreneur, that's kind of the curse and the gift of it is that it's gonna show you your limitations. It's gonna show you your walls. It's your wanting and ability to step forward and be like, all right, I'm gonna like rub elbows with this brick wall, see what I'm made out of, seek for new ways to kind of get over it, right? Get over it and find what's on the other side of it. And that's a con- consistent pattern is entrepreneurship. Any entrepreneur knows you're not comfortable. You kind of yep. have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah, something I've noticed is um, you have kind of like two stages of awareness. It's like there's that first stage of like, I'm, I'm going to do this. Uh, they have the courage to kind of like start the business and, and get out there, put themselves out there. And because it worked even to some degree to like jumpstart the project, they get going and that safety thing starts to go as they start to bump up against that new limit of now I have to maybe look at things differently because now their fear of selling is getting in the way of them being able to grow past their like attrition rate or whatever those fears and, and self-limiting beliefs look like. So then they start to kind of reassociate to those, well, this is what I did to get started. So I'm, I'm not going to change that because I know that works. Right. And so now that's like they've put a wall around their growth and their ability to break past that. And that safety piece is a conversation that we often have where they don't realize that it's not that, oh, my lead flow went down. That's why I'm not able to grow. And they start like making kind of excuses around it when really if you can just take it back to, well, let's look at how you're approaching and how you're viewing things, first of all. And now how that applies to what you're looking to accomplish, they don't line up at all. And you have to kind of go back to that factor of like, look, it wasn't safe to start it in the first place. You did it anyway. And look, it worked. Now let's take that same uh, that same strength and carry that into this next stage and saying there's going to be some new things you're going to have to do again that don't feel safe. They don't feel great. They're scary. But look, it's going to be okay anyway. What's the worst? Someone's going to say no. Right. And great. Then you're going to learn from it and do it a different way. And and the same way that you started it the first time. You told me it took you like 10 times to get the money. You had to ask 10 different people to get the money to start your business. How did you do that 10 times? It's the same thing you have to do at this level. And getting people to recognize and, and, and see that it's just the same thing again at a new place and being able to then break into like kind of like you said it's two doors and then it becomes four and then it becomes six and all of a sudden they start realizing it's totally safe it's all mine for the taking and being able to kind of guide someone through that and build that courage yeah i think that's a really good point uh you know with breakthrough work usually what pops you like what people call consciousness or awakening state or flow the first time you experience that whatever the source of that was that pain because trauma is the impetus for human consciousness okay there's like nothing happens without human trauma we we are trauma but we're also heart and open so anyway my without getting too woo woo on that part of it it's like if you um if you take on that you are responsible for everything that's like kind of occurring around you okay most people we've been trained to identify responsibility as a blame or a shame kind of tactic yeah so like in society if you look at a politics like something goes wrong okay it's all about finger pointing who caused this? Why did this happen? And if you look at that environment, if we even if we know the answer to that question, all right, who caused this? Does that move anything one iota? Does that change any fucking thing that's going on in the world? Never, right? So with with yourself, it's the same thing. If you're in a state of like dealing with responsibility, let's go blame or guilt type of thing, you're just basically like what guilt and blame does is it makes us feel like we're learning a lesson, right? But what it really does is it closes us off. So now I come to you and I say, hey, man, don't worry. That's, it's not as bad. You go, well, leave me the fuck alone. I'm already punishing myself, which means you're not listening for other possibilities that could be arising in conversation, in experiences with other people. And if you guys look for yourself, I don't know about you. Guilt and shame never taught me a fucking thing in this world. It just it kept me exactly where I was. And then I just repeated my mistakes over and over again, kind of like what you were saying, right? It's like puts you into that loop. So for me... It's super important. Like if we look at the way language is structured, it's all about creating distinctions, right? One thing distinct from another, mostly like your relationship to it. So if you have a relationship to 
responsibility in that way, what you're saying is I'm committed to basically staying put where I am, okay? So if we, again, we're looking at the age of conversation or how to redefine words to empower you so you can consciously create what you want in your life, if you look at responsibility, my definition is it's like the willingness to be at source of everything that's happening in my life, completely free of blame, right? So something goes on and I go, huh, well, how did I create that, basically, okay? I think operating any other way is like putting you in a vehicle. If I put you in a car and I was like, I want you to be fully responsible for this vehicle. And you're like, okay, well, I'm going to do it in the blame model. It's like, okay, well, I'll do the steering wheel and the gas pedal, but I'm not going to touch the steering wheel. And the car keeps fucking crashing over and over again. And you're like, well, I don't understand why it's crashing. Well, it's like, dude, take responsibility over the fucking car. Put your hands on the wheels. And most people are just not willing to put their hands on the steering wheel. So if you are, and that's like your intake, that's a filter you develop as a skill to start seeing everything through, no matter what arises in your life, you're not going to be like, okay, well, who do I need to blame? Or why is the circumstance happening to me? Or all these questions that most people ask that completely stagnate the velocity of growth that they could have. If you start looking from that place, you always, if you're there, you always look for action to take that could help you grow or resolve that issue. And instead of becoming problem oriented, you become solution oriented. Mm-hmm. So as okay. I was gonna say, as a coach, like having the, the understanding that these are kind of some of the underlying um, factors with someone's success, like the, the intellectual understanding of that, that that's happening is, is radically different than actually getting a person to actually change the way that they think and believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you actually facilitate that, that, that transformation or that change in somebody? Super good question. So, yeah, I, I information by itself makes no difference for anybody. You, mm. I, you, know, you guys probably know this too, right? You give people like the world, they're like, here you go, man, take everything. Like this will change your life and then like nothing happens. So we can look at that and say we, we've come to a place in society where we're extremely information hungry. There's a lot of great stuff out there. And again, why is it 97% of people fail at everything when they have full access to all the information that makes you successful? So if we look at that, you know, you guys are in, in the health and fitness industry. So let's even look at that. Everybody at some point has been like a pound overweight in their life, right? And then people, con- I'm sure people. Con- <laughs> not me. Not, not you, me. right? <laughs> well, in all the right places. Shredded. In all Perfect. the right places. <laughs> anyway, the point, the point of that is, is that why? Why do we have such an epidemic of obesity when all the information's out there? How difficult is it? Really? Basic work. Get, <laughs> get a workout in, eat right. No secret. And yet we have this billion dollar industry, trillion dollar industry almost, right? That's just feeding people new information like it's some fucking secret. So if we look at that, then the information they're getting doesn't make a difference. Now, you know, if you start giving someone information, you coach them, you help them implement, they have an experience, that one experience will completely radically and alter and change their life. So with coaching, it's the same way. Like I will give you the context through which to view something. And then we're going to look at an area of life that's important to you, whether it's like a relationship or your business or your health or whatever it might be and say, okay, well, how are we going to transform this? Okay, well, let's take what we applied. And what I can tell you that every br- major breakthrough I've ever caused with somebody has usually been in relationship to their parents because that, that sourced all this pain, right? All this stuff that you have going on, like your programming is your parents. It just is. So it's like, all right, your relationship with your father fucking sucks. I'm going to show you how to have a structured relationship where you take responsibility for everything that you spent your entire life blaming this person for. And what ends up happening is it creates uh, not just freedom for you, but it creates space like an experience. Okay, Not space as a concept, but space as an experience where you feel like light, like suddenly you open and anybody again who's had like an awakened state or conscious state, you know, you went from like one way of being to another, you've experienced this where it just feel, you feel like lighter, your brain seems to be like really sharp suddenly, maybe even like you see colors a little bit differently or there's like a HD sharpness to your view, something happens. What's happening is you're releasing energistic stuff that you've been holding onto for a really long period of time. And then you consciously create with this person like a new future, okay? And then that's it. It really just causes this like massive breakthrough, but that's the experience. So the other way, it's like me and you, I could, if you've never been on a bicycle and I try to explain what balance is to you, you will understand it, right? You'll, you'll understand conceptually, but you won't know it until you've done that thing and experienced it. So I could tell you, you're going to pedal these wheels. You're going to feel wind flow. You're going to be doing this. I can give you that for 40 hours. I put you on that bike. You're still falling over. But the moment you get balance, that can't be taken away from you. That's experiential. So when in our in our the way that we coach, it's the same thing. We we give people that experience, and then once you have that, it's like you see behind the veil, and it, it really is like popping the pill. You just can't go back after that. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, changing someone's mindset and changing someone's beliefs incredibly, incredibly powerful. On on the other side of it, how much how much do you focus on changing just they're simply changing their environment or the people they're around? Like if someone is a bartender at a pizza parlor and they're overweight, mm-hmm. like simply just getting someone to not be a bartender at a pizza parlor and getting them to you know to be the front desk person at a CrossFit gym where now all of a sudden they're around people that you know they just have a healthier lifestyle like the expectation is that you work out every day et cetera, et cetera. they'll kind of naturally gravitate towards that way of being and then they'll probably lose some weight and become yeah. a lot healthier just simply because they change the people they're around and their environment so so beliefs and 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 thoughts and, and whatnot radically important but how much do you do you uh, kind of counsel people on the other side of the house with the environment Okay. Uh, also, a great question. I so I want to just be really succinct with our language. Uh, mm-hmm. It's really important. We're, uh, uh, trans- like for me, transformative work is not changing what people are doing. Mm-hmm. Everything has to come from an internal choice. If I'm changing, it's as if I'm pushing an idea on you. I'm trying to control and manipulate, cajole you to think what I believe. And everybody's truth is different. As a as an educator and a teacher, I think what we see is people pushing ideas on people and then wanting them back as if that's the right way to do it. For mm-hmm. me, like a proper teacher is like I don't tell you what to see. I just show you where to look. So you can find your own truth, right? Gotcha. So if I'm helping you transform and you made that choice down the line, I don't think that, you know, in the beginning, it's like, go change your entire environment. That's going to scare the fuck out of somebody because it's going to elicit all this anxiety and questions about safety. So like, you know, from the moment me and you meet, we shake hands, right? Mm -hmm. Let's like look at how we socialize and how we build relationships with one another. We start asking each other questions like we're doing right now, right? We're all getting to know each other. I start telling you stories. But what these stories tell you, it's an upload and download of information to one another. And what these stories elicit is what you can say to me, what you can't say to me. There's all these little lessons in the background. I'm not directly telling you, but you're smart enough, socialized enough to understand, oh, fuck, God, guy doesn't like that. Oh, he cringed when I said that. Oh, his body changed when I did that. You're picking up on all these things. And what's going on is I'm now responsible, right? Again, looking from that point of view, I'm responsible for training you guys on how to deal with me like how to consciously deal with me. And what we do is we set up our environment to be exactly the way that we want it to so that our identity never gets called out. Everybody in your life agrees with who you are. Is there anybody around you that's like, I fucking hate you. You know, like they, they all agree with your identity and the, the silent agreement in society is if you don't call me out on your shit, I won't call you out on mine. So your friends are people that don't call you out on your shit unless they're really good fucking friends, right? So if we do that, and the funny part is we do this whole socialization game, and then we start being an argument with the way that it is. We don't like it, except you're the one that's responsible for having trained everyone to operate that, you, but, uh, operate that way with you. But that's just the way your identity works. It like creates, and then it's upset. It creates, and then it's upset. So when we're doing transformative work, part of your responsibility is as you transform is to actually go out there and actively tell your environment that something has shifted inside of you, right? So let's say, and this is why a lot of transformative work doesn't work for people because they don't go and share their transformation. And that, and I'm not talking about like preaching or evangelical bullshit, the stuff like that, or not bullshit, depending on what you believe. Um, but if I like, if I go and transform my relationship with my mom, like I literally see my mom in a completely different light. I let go of all this traumatic past and I'm like, wow, mom, I just see how beautiful you are. But I go back and I step into my environment, any environment, any relationship. I step back into that environment and I haven't shared with them that that shift has happened. They still talk to me and communicate with me and listen to me the way that I was before. And this is what happens to people all the time. Your power is in people's listening. Except ultimately what we do is we create agreements. Again, silent, spoken agreements with people and we break them all the fucking time. And what ends up happening is they lose, you lose trust with them over time. But what you're really losing is they're listening. And then they put all these filters over the way that they listen to you. And even when you're saying great shit, they're like, what a fucking asshole. So then you step back into this environment when you're transformed and there's zero agreement for your transformation because you haven't shared it. And they still talk to you in all the old communication patterns. They still look at you with all your old communication patterns and you go, fuck, I must not be transformed. So one of the things you want to get is we have a certain and specific way that we uh, interact with reality, right? So our five senses are one way that we interact with reality and gauge whether it's true or not true. Another really important one is we uh, understand reality through agreement. If everyone agrees on it, it must be true. But history has taught us over and over again that that's not a good test for reality. At some point, the earth was flat. Everyone agreed. Not true. At some point, the earth was sent to the universe. Everyone agreed. Not true, right? So in your life, all these people you set up, this environment, is all just a bunch of agreement about who you are. And again, if you transform yourself and there's no new agreement that you've put in place and now have integrity with, it's really, really difficult to transform your life because you're constantly going to get feedback from this environment that you're not, and you will be the average of the people you spend time with. 
I want to I want to just talk about transformation. Just using that word at all, uh, I think some sometimes I would say a lot of the the transformation. A lot of people are listening to this show when they think about transformation. They think about like a physical transformation. Mm -hmm. I go, my physique changed. Mm -hmm. And they think about all the things that need to change and what they're doing to make that happen. And I think that was like a distinction you were getting close to. And maybe I'll just say it differently. Yeah, yeah. please do. Uh, is that we can change what people are doing. And we can manipulate things in their lives. They can manipulate their environment. You can manip manipulate all these things to change a behavior. And that, to me, is the long way around and getting to getting – getting someone to be different yes and so uh in a in the work that you do one of the things i've noticed is you kind of skip the doing part like we're not going to try to create an environment and create a program where it's going to take years for you to do these things and change these habits what you are going after is changing how someone is their being, being you change yeah. the being and then all the doing automatically starts falling into place i don't know how many times I've seen somebody's being change, and once they're being changed, all the things that they were trying to do in the first place, you know, put down the donut, uh, drop the job that wasn't working for them, mm -hmm. uh, going to the gym consistently goes from being a chore to being easy. And these are all things from, that just happen from being different, or even the training program they were trying to do, once they become a different person, then they realize, I didn't even want to do that kind of training in the first place. I want to do this the whole right. time. And so, but I, th I thought that I needed to look this way. I thought I needed to behave this way. I thought I needed to be able to perform these things for people to like me. Now that I'm, that now that I've decided that I'm, th this is who I really am. This is what I want to be. Then all of a sudden, like a lot of these choices, which used to be a chore, just become easy and and self evident, right? It's right. like almost like just because again, oh, it's, I didn't even know I wanted that, right. but now I do. Because you're living in a in a different paradigm of possibility now. Before, like most people are restricted to like one or two paradigms. That's all they see the world through. It's like no motherfucker, you're an infinite being with infinite ways to be, and in every one of those, there's different cases for action. Like, if you want to know why you're getting the results you're getting, look at your intentions. Like it's however you are in life and your way of being is giving you the exact results you want. Like the honest truth of it, like to be perfectly blunt, if you are not getting results in life, you're either not doing the work and lying about it or you're doing the wrong fucking work and you're lying about it. It's pretty much what it comes down to, right? So again, why aren't you taking that action? And that's such a good point. I think most people are trying to change their life through willpower. And willpower is like a car that's running on fumes. It's fucking running great, but it, you go 120 miles per hour. That doesn't mean the engine's not about to fucking explode though. So it feels great when you're driving that fast, but boom, done. And that's like what I think most people are looking for is like these pops, quick fixes, all that kind of stuff. Again, like a light bulb is brightest the moment before it stops working. It's just poof, gives out that energy burst and done. I would much rather you have a consistent stream than just one pop and then you're back into darkness, right? So it's, it's really well stated. We, you know, Western philosophy works with do, have, be. What do I need to do? to have the things that I want to become the person that I want to be. Yeah. Eastern philosophy is be, do, have. So what, like, how do I shift my being? That being leads me to doing different things and then I have the things that I want. So I'll ask you guys a simple question. Do any of you guys ever wake up in the morning and go, today I'm going to be a man? Does that ever occur to you? Nope. Never, right? Now, when you get in a car, do you ever think to yourself, today I'm going to be a driver? Nope. nope. Right? You just, you just, you are that so naturally. Now, when you're being a man, you take a, actions a man takes, you get the results a man gets. You get in a car, you become a driver, you take actions a, re, a driver takes, you get the results a driver gets. And in those ways, it's so simple and natural, yet in every other place in our life when we're like, well, I want to be successful or I want to be happy. It's honestly, I know it's, it sounds so simple. It's simple when you get it like an experience. It's not easy to get there because of all the resistance you have against believing that it could be that effortless because we've been taught work hard you know, all that stuff. Like I'm an immigrant. I am like, put that shit on my shoulders. I got this, you know, like that's, that's my upbringing. And I've had to learn to bring effortlessness into my life through different alternate choosing states of being so that all that stuff just opens up to me. And I'm, I'm with you. Like when you're doing the willpower thing, it's like trying to push through, make things happen. And that's all the world of more, better, different. And then you just get more, better, different of the same results you already have. And then you're just constantly frustrated, right? If you're in the world of of being, it's going to be like a pull towards doing actions. And you're like, this is effortless. I love doing this stuff. I'm passionate about what I'm doing. And, you know, entrepreneurs who have kind of broken through that are highly successful. 
Yeah, because there's a difference between being an entrepreneur who feels like they're always pushing this stone up a hill mm -hmm. and an, an entrepreneur who's waking up and just like, man, life is good. Yep. It's easy. I'm going to do the things I want to do. And at the end of the day, I'm not burnt out. I'm just happy. This is fantastic. And that's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to take a break real quick and we come back, dig into maybe how to be different yeah, without sure. having to do all the doing. Sure. I'm Ryan Butchantini, owner of KDA CrossFit in San Diego. Um, what I was struggling with most was definitely getting athletes in the door. Um, there's a ton of gyms in the San Diego area, and it was really, I was having a tough time really differentiating myself from the kind of local populace of gyms in the area. So I reached out to Logic, um, went through their kind of initial breakdown of the business, really revamped and went through where we were lacking, ended up redoing the website, going through our entire email campaign, and it really set us up to start to harvest leads a little bit more organically and allowed us to connect with our athletes, our potential athletes, on a much more thorough basis. There, were, I definitely had some reservations when I started researching Logic, um, I just wasn't sure what the like return of investment was going to be. I've gone through programs like this before that I wasn't 100% really satisfied with. Um, but after sitting down and talking with Marcus, talking with the rest of the team, I decided to kind of take the jump, and I haven't looked back since. It's been we've doubled doubled our membership in less than three months we went from about 50 members to just under 100 at this point so the biggest benefit to our growth uh, it's allowed us to really expand our community um, from a financial standpoint obviously it's pretty fantastic to grow the gym has just been significantly more fun with more people coming in and out the door on a daily basis so retention after joining Logic, uh, we've seen a huge increase. We were never really bad at retaining our athletes, but having some sort of constant survey that we always follow up with our athletes, whether it's three months, six months, a year out, or weekly, whatever, whatever we can do, um, Logic has really allowed us to find what things we can refine to make the athlete experience that much better and keep them coming back day after day after day. Working with the Barbell Logic team um, has completely shifted my direction as a business owner. Um, instead of just worrying about like the day-to-day, -day, the really minute things, they've allowed me to look at the bigger picture and how I can really grow my business and kind of step out of the mundane and look at the big picture options of where I need to start driving the business. Hands down, no questions asked. If you're not on Logic yet, you need to get there ASAP. It's gonna totally redefine how you operate and it's gonna make your life significantly easier as an owner. If you're on the fence about Logic, just make the phone call, get over whatever limitations you have, whatever ego reason you have for not wanting to call them, it's gonna be the best decision you make giving that team a call and just getting a chance to really dig deep into your business. And we're back with Guy Ferdman talking about uh, the universe, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> it's usually where the conversations go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where, where did we leave off, actually? Uh... We were wanting to find out more about Man, oh, we, yeah. we told you to discuss this before we got <laughs> back. <laughs> <laughs> it's we, Saturday. No, we, we started. Yeah, it is Saturday. Um, we were talking a little bit about. We well, were talking about being different. Yes. And the difference between a lot of us focus uh, on. I actually have this written on my mirror. I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, be greater than uh, your environment, mm. your body, and time. Mm. And so these are. These are. This is some. That that specific statement is someone I something I picked up from Joe Dispenza, but it, which is in the vein of a lot of things that we're talking about, mm -hmm. uh, and so that I do see the two ways of creating change for somebody is you have to change uh, their time and body, um, not time. You change their environment and body. Changing time is magic. It's magic. <laughs> <laughs> we won't get into that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But the 
the only reason we won't talk about that, I think it, it might just be. A, it's ethereal and it's not going to get yeah. practical. Yeah, usage. it's it's not going to be it's not going to be as helpful. Yeah, it's more think. it's more like quality of life we're talking about than getting results that's in a, a specific area. That's a that's a deeper philosophy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, uh, we were talking about changing the environment or or kind of like uh, I talked to a lot of people in fitness. It's like okay, I want to get the deeper change and we can start from the outside in and that's super possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, what we're diving into is how to turn from the inside out and the. I, I think that in the future, I think the future of strength and conditioning coaching, the, the future of health and fitness coaching is l- teaching people how to be. Um, mm-hmm. what, do, what, uh, what do you see that stands in the way of people changing how they are and, and, and their being? And I've heard comments like, um, like I make these comments sometimes and people kind of, mm-hmm. you know, step back, which is I'm a different person or I want to be different. Yes. Or, um, and then people are like, oh, is that true? Do you really want to be different? And like, it's a scary thing. Yeah, or yeah, yeah. Why would you want to be a different person? And the what, and you were talking about before is where, um, like who I hang out with and who I, uh, and the conversations I'm having now uh, are different than what they were five years ago. Mm-hmm. I'm, uh, if I were to try to hang out with myself five years ago, I wouldn't even enjoy it. Absolutely. It would be, it would be boring. I get, well, it would be boring. I'll just say that. Um, <laughs> I'm so happy I didn't know you back then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Only five years ago, you would have loved five years ago. Me, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, the whole idea of being different, how do you get people to basically skip the doing part? Because everyone is so focused, like you were saying. Yeah. Western philosophy has shaped how we do everything, how our education system. Mm-hmm. If you grew up in the West, then this is exactly how you think. There's... There's not, you can't be like, oh, you know, not me. It's like, no, you were raised in the system mm-hmm. that, that exists in this philosophy. And this is just how, this is how all of our, our language um, has formed and it's creating our reality. And, uh, and the idea of being different before getting the result is just because we tend to externalize. I'll be happy when, or right. if I have this thing, right. um, then I'll be happy. And I'm, and, but until then I'm going to be completely miserable so how do we – what's the trick to skipping uh, the experience part? <laughs> <laughs> what, what's the trick to being and then, and then calling in the experience versus trying to force the experience? Yeah, well, Magic bullets, we want them. Yeah, the magic bullets, <laughs> um, enemas for sure. Uh, the, <laughs> the, um, the trick is that there is no trick. Uh, you know, I don't think that there's a shortcut to anything. I actually made a post the other day about um, like people want to travel a mile. We only sell shortcuts here, guy. You only sell that's shortcuts? What I brought, that's what I brought you in for. I am going to do a really, really bad job then. <laughs> um, I, I, uh, look, I, I think you know, coaching, if we look at coaching, right, it's ultimately – it is a shortcut. In, in essence of it, it's a guidance system. Mm-hmm. Like I know that what's taken me 15 years to master, learn, whatever you want to call it um, – if you spend time with me, you'll probably get to the same understandings and ways of being and operating in probably like two or three years, mm-hmm. like with, with a lot of exposure to that kind of languaging and operating. That's nothing to sneeze at, you know? And I think one of the things people don't appreciate when you get a coach, so like my rate uh, easily can be above $2,000 an hour for coaching, okay? And for a lot of people, they're like, holy fuck. But what you really got to look at, it, that's like, you're saying I'm worth that much to invest in myself. You're not getting just an hour of my time. You're getting 15 years of my experience mm-hmm. for that $2,000. And what that one hour conversation can do can have you break through in areas that you've been stagnant in for decades. Right? And probably areas that you've been stagnant in that you didn't know you were stagnant in. Absolutely. I, I don't know how many times I've worked with a coach where I'm like, this part of my life improved tremendously and I didn't even know that was possible. Right. Yeah. So if you... I think people are very short-term oriented. Again, we live in like a doing quick fix, uh, download the fucking app, get the search. Like we're just an on-demand society now, which is extremely restricting in a lot of ways. You know, if you're driving down a highway, let's say, a lot of people are, that are bad drivers get in accidents because they only stare at the car in front of them. They look at the brake lights and they have very little time to respond to what's going on. A good driver is looking way up the road, 10 cars deep. They see the brake lights and they see the trail and they're planning ahead they're coasting you know they have all the time in the world to do stuff so you're not in a reactive state like most people are and that's approach to people's life so they want to get a mile but they don't want to fucking walk an inch and i did the math on it it's 63,360 inches for a mile so it's like that's a lot of inches to crawl to get to that mile and most people just won't take that first step into seeing what it might look like to alter their state 
but we kind of had that conversation before about like getting the information, but then having like a real world application and then the experience of it arises. Once that experience is there, you're much, much, much more likely to go start taking actions consistent with what you want. And then just to go like touch back on what you said about being different. For me, that's a fucking gift. There's, there's, we've, I think we've spent a lot of time in society standardizing what a human being is. And that's why there's a lot of shame and guilt in this world. Like if you look at a child, they're free and they're, they're popping in between all these different states. Like I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm this and that, right? Nothing gets stuck. They're like, nothing gets stuck on that. And then they stuck. They don't get stuck in a single state or a single emotion. Yeah, there's and like, no so, way that they think that they're supposed to be. Exactly. They're, they're just not a, like, oh, I felt sad. I I shouldn't feel sad. Yeah. So now I'm going to shame it. Like explain it. Why did I do this? Like they don't do that. But now they have this underlying sadness that's always kind of like sitting there. Well, not necessarily because if you look at a child, they go like, I'm. They're crying their eyes. I'm out. talking Next. about as an adult. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. As we, an adult, we like to suppress it. Absolutely. We don't want to show it because that's not how we're supposed to be. And then now there's just this underlying sadness that sticks. Like the energy of that that emotion gets, it's it's stagnant. Yeah, we well we stuff happens and we resist, right? And when you resist, it's like putting up a hand against another hand. It's like okay, if you put up your hand, I got my hand. Like shit ain't going anywhere. But if I stop resisting, your hand goes through. Yeah, you get back in flow. You get back in velocity. So it's really about just like constantly in surrender. And a child is always in surrender. What I think ends up happening is at around seven years old, the mind kicks in logic. There's no logic up until then. And then it starts, that logic part starts understanding the so, the social standardization of human. And you start judging your past immediately mm-hmm. by, you know, all the things you've already done that are not a, what a standard human does. You start making yourself wrong. That's why we start medicating kids right away to fucking standardize them. Like, act the way we're telling you to act versus just being this infinite, I want to fucking do whatever I want type of being. So, like, being different is a, such a fucking gift in this world. And to go back to that point, like ducks swim with ducks, swans swim with swans. You will be the average of the people you spend your time around. If those, so like if, you know, entrepreneurs say, who, take your five closest friends, take their income, average that, that's your income. If you want to upgrade your life, upgrade your, upgrade the people you spend your time with. If you spend your time with millionaires, you'll be a fucking millionaire. You spend, you want to be a doctor, they spend time with doctors. It's just how it goes. I mean, schools are set up that way. Everything's set up that way. Yeah. So you have to like choose and there, and it's difficult because it, there's a process of letting go. And in coaching, we call it like destroy to create, you know, like what are you going to let go of to create space in your life to go create something else? And anybody who's been in long-term relationships, whether they're business or loving ones, you know, like how painful it is to maybe let go of somebody, although it really doesn't have to be that painful of an experience as a choice. And you know, the massive growth that usually happens right after those situations where you're like, oh my God, this is amazing. And it's the best thing that's ever happened to me. And you've got to just kind of trust in those experiences that when you're looking to radically shift where your life is going, that there m- you might have to look around your environment and be like, all right, what is no longer serving me? These people are no longer serving me. Every time you go there, if you have a conversation with somebody and you feel like you need fucking vitamins at the end of that conversation, <laughs> chances are that relationship needs to come to an end. Yeah. You know, so it's like, for me, it's really simple. Like if I'm talking to someone, I feel expansion. I'm like lit up. My brain's like, oh fuck, that was awesome. I'm like, yes, I'm such a yes to this relationship. If I go in, and immediately, like they have this like dominant energy, or I start feeling like I'm going internal, or I shrink. It's a, that's just a no relationship for me, and I've gotten really good at letting go of things without creating all this chaos. Because a lot of times we let go of relationships, and it's with anger. So we start doing all these really negative things to people. So on that on that note, in regards to letting go, I feel that's a big, that's a huge step in people kind of accepting a coach and accepting mm-hmm. like, okay, maybe I do, I should get the help. I should have someone else like guide me through this. And it's, I find it interesting that in our industry where it is coaches, that's what, that's who we're talking to. There's still a resistance to getting coached. Yes. Right. And so they're like, well, I'm, you know, they're preaching coaching constantly to, you know, well, that's why we're here. That's what you're paying the premium for to be a part of our gym is because (laughs) I'm here to coach you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to, I'm going to help you get there much faster, much more safely. The second it comes to like breaking through in their business, these walls come up and it's just, well, I, I don't really, I'm not sure if I want to do this or it's scary or whatever, whatever fear starts to pop up. What do you ask or what do you say to someone or, or how do you kind of help people break through and acknowledge that it is maybe a good decision for you to, to get the help and, and, mm-hmm. and kind of fast track rather than stay on the pain train like indefinitely? Yeah, I, I think when it comes to like a sales situation, right, where there's an opportunity to take some action in some area of life in this society, again, we exchange value for money and that's just how it works. So, you know, you can't get by it. However, it seems to me we've been trained to, the, to not really assess what's good for us. And to just be like, I don't have time, I don't have money. It's like the ultimate knee-jerk reaction. And we've learned to use that stuff because like really what do you say to somebody who has no time 
or money, right? Because again, it's like in, in the languaging, it's I don't have time, not I won't make time or I won't make the money to do this thing. Mm -hmm. And they do that and they stop. And what you're doing is you're not letting the brain actually look for opportunity and possibility of what this could lead to, how this can alter and change the future that you really, really want. And it creates all that resistance. I always just say, okay, well, if that's the situation, you know, like where do you want to go? What, what are your actual goals? And it's like, well, let's look at how you're operating right now. Is that consistent? Can you see that this would is consistent with that future that you said that you want? And if there's no consistency there, well, let's look at that the actions you're taking, we can predictably say, will not lead you to where you want to be in the future. So, okay, if we were going to work together, my assignment is to help you start establishing and creating a story for a new future that you want to step into. One of the things that we've taught ourselves and the human brain believes, and it's like society-wide, is that who you are in the present moment is a function of your past. Like it's what happened with your parents, the movies you saw, all these things have shaped you. And in essence, we can provide a lot of evidence to show that that's true. But I want to kind of throw something in the face of that and say that that's just a way of looking at it. And we can look at things in a really different way. What's really going on is who you are in the present moment is actually impacted by the future that you're stepping into. So I'll give you an example. If you're like, uh, if you've been in, you know, had a job and we've all had shit jobs at some point in time, I'm sure. But let's say like I'm a New Yorker. It's like February, middle of fucking winter. It's snowing outside, bitterly cold. Uh, it's Friday afternoon. My boss is writing me. Emails coming in. Phone won't stop ringing. Like there's just a shit ton to do. Any other day I'd be upset. Today I'm not upset. And the reason for that is in three hours, I have two tickets in my desk drawer that are taking me and my favorite person to Hawaii for two weeks. Do you give a shit at all what's happening in that office that day? Are you like, fuck it, I'm out of here, right? It's like those memes you see, like, fuck it, I'm out of here. <laughs> and then like two weeks later, fast forward, you're in Hawaii, most beautiful place on the planet, hammock, you've been looking good, working out, eating healthy, but you know it's three hours, you got to go back on that plane, back to that shithole place. How do you feel in that moment, right? So who we are in the present moment is really impacted by the future that we're expecting. And for business owners, it's the same thing. Whatever, however you feel right now, whatever actions you're taking in the present moment right now are actually give, being given to you by the future that you're stepping into. I consciously and predictably choose my future all the time because I know it's going to start impacting me in the present. And you all know this, you buy a ticket for something, it starts impacting you. Mm -hmm. You're going to go to the gym, you're going to know you're going to be on the beach, you're working out fucking harder. You're going to buy new clothes. You're doing this, you're doing that, right? Like there's actions you take, that's the pull that Making we're looking for, right? Instead of how do I make it happen? And we were talking about like limitations on the wall. So most people operate like, well, I want to throw my hat over the wall. I want to risk something. But first, let me figure out how I'm going to get the hat back, which is completely cutting off ingenuity because if you really want to get your fucking hat back, you want to get over that wall, throw the hat over the wall and you will then put yourself in a mode, be impacted by the future that in the present, you'll actually figure out how to go get that hat back. That's so, great analogy. Right? So, mm -hmm. and that's exactly kind of what you want to, talk to people about it's like what's the future you're creating let's okay well here's that wall what action what can we take right now to put in the future that hat going over the wall so that we can both start looking and investigating together and be in a dance for how you can show up differently in your way of being that you're going to be like called to be in action to get the results that you want mm -hmm. it's kind of like we used to tell people that that they they always said that it, they didn't have enough money to go on like a big trip they right. like, always want to go to europe i always want to go to australia or whatever and we're like just Buy the plane ticket. Right. Just buy the plane ticket. Buy it for like six months from now or a year from now. And then by the time you get there, you'll have figured out how to afford the rest of the trip somehow, some way, because you, you've taken that that big first initial step. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And without getting too ethereal, I, I believe the universe rewards bold action. And it's just like when you put that stuff in the future, there's just a, an energistic alignment towards a future. And like the, and I'm sure you guys have experienced this many times in your life where just like weird circumstances start happening. Like a person comes out of nowhere or this starts happening. And I think when it comes to money, again, we're, we're so linear in our thinking about where money comes from because it's like an effort based energy, which it's not money is just, again, it's, it's a, it's your belief in your personal value. The money in your bank account will equal what your personal belief about your personal value is. Rich people grow around grow around conversations that are very abundant based around money. So they there's no effort to them in receiving more. They just fucking know it's coming and all the circumstances of their life align to do that. When you're a worker, you've been told, again, work really hard, blah, 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 play by the rules and everything will work out. I don't know about you guys. I look out in society. That is not panning out for fucking a lot of people. So it's probably not the best way to be operating. So again, we really want to look at how do we create a future? Have you take bold action? Then start seeing like these cosmic, again, I know it's getting a little ethereal, but like cosmic phenomenons that are happening um, that just give you trust to go take more and more action. So like 
I can tell you like my, my training is ontological in nature. Okay. And what that means is that I'm, I'm pointing to phenomenology. There's all these phenomenons that if you're not aware of, you're at the effect of them and then you can't do anything about it. So for instance, again, like a car analogy, if you have a blind spot in the car and there's a physical object next to you, right? Whether or not you see that physical object, you go into that lane, it's going to be a fucking problem. However, as a coach, if I'm like, PS, there is a car here, right? Blind spot, boom, making completely different choices in life. So it's really about that. We're all walking around with blind spots and however you turn, you got a fucking blind spot. I got blind spots. I don't know where all my shit is, right? And I will have them for the rest of my life. A coach's job is to have a conversation with you, really get it, listen, be like, oh, I see your blind spot. Let me tell you what it is. Put it here. You have completely different choices to make. So someone's blind spot might actually be the fact that they need a coach, yes. but they don't see that they need a coach. Yes. How would someone know if that is in fact their blind spot? How do you know if you need a coach? Uh, you don't. And honestly, like I know this is probably not the answer you want to hear. I'm just going to tell you what I believe. If you're if you're in that space, you're not coachable. I don't even want to coach you. You're not mm -hmm. you're not worth my effort of my value. Like if I try to coach a person like that, what I'm saying is I, I don't believe in my personal value. That's the that's the message I'm sending out there. If somebody tells me like I don't believe I need a coach, you're right, you don't. Because even if I convince you and I do that and I could, right, manipulate you through language, all these different things people do, NLP practices. I know so many fucking marketers that go out there and use like NLP copywriting on people which is basically like a light state of hypnosis that you put someone in so they make a decision that they might have not normally made. Those people have 40% return on their products because the person wakes up the next day, pops out of their hypnosis, goes, why the fuck did I buy that product? I would have never done that before. And that's how you know, like whether you're manipulating somebody or controlling them into believe something, or are you really standing for something and people see that you're standing for them for something, you're the space of creation for them. I think in that space, like our products have had less than a 2% refund rate since I've started. And it's because everything is done with that. Like I'm not looking to work with people who are not a fuck yes fit for me that are absolutely, I'm like, yeah, I can work with you. You're coachable. I know I can make a difference for you. There's no point to coach people who aren't coachable. Yeah, we have a, we actually have a, a process in for, so one of the platforms that we offer for gym owners is Barbell Logic, which is a whole like web automation, like hybrid coaching mm -hmm. uh, service. And part of that process in the beginning is a discovery call. And oftentimes people will say to me, because I do these calls, they'll think it's just, it's a sales call. And I'm like, no, let me correct you. This is actually a two-way interview. <laughs> mm. Because if you're, not, if you're not really dedicated to building an awesome business and you're not willing to be guided and get the help, then we're not a good fit for you. If you're looking for a shortcut or a silver bullet, just like you said, I'm not for hire. We're not, we're not, we don't want to work with you because we're not going to be able to serve you. Mm -hmm. If you're looking for the shortcut, please hire someone else who will sell you the shortcut and let you get away with not actually doing the work. It's not what we're about. We are here to like really build a, a great business for someone who gives a shit about their, their clients, their future, their happiness and, and making an impact in their market. That's our jam. Right. And so this, like this process on the front end to really get to know someone and understand is this really, you know, what are you wanting to accomplish? And, and it's a very different phone call right out of the gate. You know, when someone is getting on the phone, excited to, they may be nervous. They may be fearful around like, I don't know if I can, but I'm, I'm ready to, or this is really important to me, or I've got to make this work. Awesome. Let's rock and roll versus the person who's like, they're poking, they're testing, you know, dipping their toe in and like sure. just checking it out. But you can immediately read or they'll say things like, yeah, but I already know what I'm doing. I just need a this, or I just need a that. And it's like, Hey, cool. We, you know, we turned down quite a few people that would think that they could just buy the service and it's actually not how it works at all. Sure. Well, I mean, if somebody knows what they need, right, mm -hmm. and they're still not getting the result, then clearly they fucking don't know what they need. That's exactly And you've got to like be like, well, is that really working for you? Let's investigate. Because again, people aren't really related to their realities. They're related to the conversation in their head that is like giving them some illusion of the reality. But it's like, okay, let's look at your results. Mm -hmm. Do you have the results you want? Nope. Then I guess that's not fucking working, right? I think also when you come to those places, like certain people will probably offer services like you guys do too. And then they would talk to somebody and take them on as a client. But that's because they're probably in a place in their life where they're in survival mode also. And they just need that income stream. They don't know that they can actually help this person or maybe they can't at all. Mm -hmm. But they're like, yeah, I'll take your money and I'll work with you. Like if, if I'm looking at who I want to be coached by, it's not somebody who's like with me or like just a degree above me. I want somebody who's here who's in a complete thrive mentality, whose motivation to help me is not limited by finances alone, even though I don't think any of us can be like, oh, I don't give a shit about money because money does provide a lot. But ultimately, it's like if you're a heart-centered person who really gives a shit about making a difference for people, you're going to operate in a really different way. So if you're like in a thrive place in your life where you believe in abundance and wealth, like that's why I fucking want to spend my time around. 
I don't want to spend time with somebody who's like, oh shit, I'm still, gotta, I'm still trying so hard, hard. And, and for some people, that's still appropriate. Those people can still serve in their own way. But I think you know, it's, it's a powerful thing to get in a place in your life where you can say no. And a lot of people who are on their way up, you know, you say like, say yes to everything, say yes to everything. I agree with that to an extent until you get to the point in your life where you're so clear about who you are, what your value is, how you want to serve, where when it doesn't fit, you're like, I'm not the right person for you. This isn't it. And money alone does not motivate me to take these actions anymore. I remember that process, saying yes to everything. And then it was almost as if overnight you had to say no to everything. Mm-hmm. It was a, it takes time to learn that. Sure. To even learn to do that because then there's a lot of emotions that come mm-hmm. around saying no to people. You got to know, you really got to know yourself and you got to really know what's important to you. And for a lot of people, they, you know, because of the work environment, because of the school environment, have really not been exposed to environments that have let them creatively really find out who the fucking they are. They've been told who they need to be. They bought into those stories. And because of that, they're passionless and they don't love what they're doing and they're fucking miserable. And even for, you know, people who are my organization, I don't really hire people full time. I tell them you're not full time, you're not part time, you're task time. Like, I just need shit done. You're my get shit done person, basically. I'm like, what I want is for you to be able to pursue your passion. Like, you might be aligned with what I'm doing. You might even believe in what I'm doing strongly. But if it's not 100%, yes, this is what I want to do with my life, at some level, you have regret that you're not doing what you really want. And at some level, you're actually holding it against me. Like, I'm the person holding you back from doing that. I would prefer you do tasks that I need you to do and then go work on what you want. Because I want a person who's living in their zone of genius in their passion is a fuck yes to life at all times and then brings that energy into my company and and helps me build something versus like i need you to do something and they're like you know like sitting behind the computer miserable no point Mm -hmm. when you got that shirt were you still on a fuck yes to everything mode (laughs) i think i know that guy awesome (laughs) super comfy yeah super comfy the shirt is awesome we love you dirk and if you're listening to this right now (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I think we'll wrap up here. Uh, if people want to find out more about what you're up to, where should they uh, uh, find you? Yeah, two websites, uh, satoriprime.com, uh, S-A-T-O-R-I-P-R-I-M-E.com, or you will have it all.com. Uh, we're like in a full-on rebrand, so if you go on now and a week or two from now, the website might look completely different. But Dope. yeah, thanks, guys. Anything on social media? Uh, Follow you anywhere? Yeah, just uh, Satori Prime all over the place. Do a search, you'll find us. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for joining right us. Yeah, buddy. Yeah. Thank thanks you. Thanks for coming on the show.